two decades of success under legendary coach Ralph Shug Jordan, Auburn football endured hard times in the 1970s. Jordan's successor, Doug Barfield, averaged a little less than six wins per season during his five-year tenure, and the Tigers' losing streak to arch-rival Alabama stretched to eight games by 1980. Seeking a fresh start, Auburn leadership initially looked east to one of Shug's boys, Tiger alum Vince Dooley head coach at Georgia since 1964, and a winner of the 1980 National Championship. But Dooley's roots in Athens had grown too deep by then, so Auburn turned elsewhere, to little-known Pat Dye, a Georgia alum who'd cut his coaching teeth as an assistant for nine years at Alabama under its legend, Bear Bryant. Dye's resume in seven seasons as head coach at smaller programs was impressive. He turned losing programs around, winning 70% of his games at East Carolina and Wyoming. With the Bryant era at Alabama surely drawing to a close, Auburn decision makers saw an opportunity to put an end to the Crimson Tide's dominance and shift the balance of power in the state. And many believed Dye was the ideal choice to expedite that shift, leading Auburn football boldly into the future. So on January 2nd, 1981, the Pat Dye era began on the Plains, and from that day forward, Auburn football would never be the same. A primary component of Dye's plan was to sell the best athletes in the state on the idea of being part of an Auburn resurgence. In no time, the coach and his assistants were in the homes of top blue-chip prospects making their pitch. One of those homes was in Bessemer, Alabama, where a talented youngster named Vincent Bo Jackson lived with his mom and nine siblings. My little neighborhood was called Martintown, uh, and that's between Bessemer and McCullough. People think that he lived in a little wooden house and a little shack. No, he, he didn't. They had a nice brick house. Bo lived with his mom, great lady. She worked hard. She had 10 kids. My mother worked two jobs, and and uh, we just made do. She, uh, she, she kept the hammer on. That's the fibers of me. Um, um, growing up there, the eighth of 10 kids in a house that was less than a thousand square feet. There was not a lot of room in that house. And um, it wasn't the most economically advanced city in Bessemer at that time. I'm the product of that. 
and uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. A soft-spoken adolescent, Bo let his athletic ability do the talking for him. Superhuman exploits on the track, football, and baseball fields became a part of everyday fare for McAdory High School coaches and teammates. We had to push him just like we pushed all of our kids. But we had a lot of good kids, and I think, I think probably he and some others we had brought some average players like me and you up. Coach Atchison took that young kid, that raw bully, and he harnessed all that energy and meanness that I had and funneled it into what progressed through junior high and high school. Well, you know, we didn't treat him any different. I mean, we had little things that we had to make him do that he didn't want to do, and just like any other kid in high school. He harnessed that energy that I had and used it in a very productive way, and it allowed me to use it in a very productive way. Of course, everybody thinks running back, running back, running back, but we played leads in a dental clinic his senior year, and he was at fullback, and Edwin Mack, the little tailback, was back behind him, and we ran a little tall sweep with Bo leading him around the corner, and Bo actually pancaked three guys and led Edwin on about an 80-yard touchdown run. He's the only kid I've ever seen that every time he touched the ball, people would start coming out of their seat waiting for something to happen that they hadn't seen before. And he came back and said that was his favorite play. He said, I'd rather do that than run the ball. Baseball scouts and football recruiters wasted no time descending on McAdory athletic events, creating a circus-like atmosphere for Bo and his coaches. His unique talent in football and baseball left Bo with a difficult decision to make, with most expecting he'd either sign a big contract to play professional baseball or travel 40 miles west on I-2059 to suit up for Alabama and Bear Bryant. Bo's ultimate decision demonstrated that even early on, he was his own man. Everybody thought he was going to go to Alabama because Alabama was only like 40 minutes away. Of course, they had Bear Bryant. And uh, one thing led to another. This, I come home one day from, ba from a baseball game, and I look in, and there's a guy sitting at the table with my mom having coffee. And I see he has on his Alabama uh, shirt, got a big A on his shirt. And I'll never forget these words as long as I live. He said, personally, I don't think you'll get a chance to get some good playing time until the end of your sophomore, the beginning of your junior season. And that's when I hit the brakes and the smoke's coming from the tires and you do the Fred Flintstone where you punch your foot through the bottom of the car and you skid and I just, hold on here. One, one of the key things in recruiting anytime your kids want a chance to play. I'm not the type of guy that sit and watch somebody else have fun. I say, you are going to tell me that I'm going to literally be on the practice squad for two years and not play. And, uh, and I think that's probably one of the reasons that Bo Jackson came to Auburn. He looked at our, you know, looked at our running back situation and he knew that he could come in here and play, step on the field and play the first year. I'm just sitting there smiling at this guy. I'm like, oh, really? Really? But in my mind up here, I'm saying, you got to be out of your damn mind if you think I'm going to go and sit for, for two years. And then he had the audacity to say, we know the only other school you're interested in is Auburn, which I swear to God, I didn't know where Auburn was. And he said, if you were to go to Auburn, you'll never beat Alabama. Because Auburn hadn't beat Alabama since 1972. And you never will. Well, Coach Dye came by a couple of times during the season, but uh, Bobby Wallace was, was the main recruiter and, uh, of both. But, you know, it's just every time they saw him, they said, we got to have this guy. The next week, 
This gentleman comes up to see me. I walk in the house again, my baseball uniform. Two more white guys sitting at the table with my mom. He said, my name is Pat Dye. He said, I'm into my second year at Auburn coaching. He said, to make a long story short, Auburn needs some running backs. And he said, I really don't know what your plans are, where are you looking at going to school? He said, but I tell you this, on my word, if you were to come to Auburn, you would have every chance on the planet, like every other running back that we're recruiting. Are you considering Auburn in your future? I said, Coach, I can do one better than that. I am coming to Auburn. And he, and he just said, all right. And he turned around and just walked upstairs. And I finished doing my laundry. And that was the end of that. I never asked him again. You know, he's drafted number one by the by New York. And uh, people kept asking me, what, what about Bo going to play baseball? I said, I said, well, he told me he's coming to Auburn and Bo's never done anything he, except what he said he was going to do. So I never called him <laughs> and asked him. I never gave him a chance to tell me no. So he signed. One of the most significant signings in Auburn history. As Coach Dye would later say, Bo Jackson gave Auburn the greatest thing any person can ever give, and that was hope. The winter of 1981, Pat Dye and his staff set about looking for young men upon which they could build a foundation for success. The weeding out process was intense, unpleasant, and effective. I knew I had a good staff. And, uh, and I knew we could win. And it was just a matter of convincing the players and recruiting the kind of kids it took to win in the Southeastern Conference. There was definitely a change um, going on. Um, you could tell it not only by the current players that had been here before, but you could just tell it in the, in the, in the whole attitude and atmosphere and culture around Auburn athletics. First meeting, Coach Dye comes in. First thing he said was, if the meeting's at three o'clock, you be here 10 minutes early, all right? If I'm here at 2.55, the meeting's at three, you late, and man, that's all hell breaks loose. Second thing, he starts talking and Marshall Riley and Donna Humphrey are sitting at the front laughing and joking. He just got out of his conversation and said, get them out of here. Those are our two best players now. Get them out of here. If they can't sit here and listen to me while I talk, they don't deserve to be on this team. Get them out of here. You could tell the, the attitude was different, that uh, it was all business, and that he came in, if you will, with a mission. That was the mentality he pressed upon us, that, hey, look, it's, it's the old school, hard nose get it done or be gone my way or the highway. Virgil Knight was our strength coach and he would say, all right, we're gonna run 14. And I don't remember what the time was, but let's say we're gonna run 14 40s in under, you know, six seconds. And everybody on the team had to make them in under six seconds or that one didn't count. And you could bet that whether we made them or not, when you got to 12 or 10 or 13, it was gonna be, no, that one doesn't count. And ultimately, I think the fewest we ever ran in any workout was probably 27. And he didn't stop uh, until it was perfect. I recall starting practice over from the top a few times. But I don't think there was a, a place in, in the country during the spring of 1981 that was any tougher than Auburn, Alabama was during spring football practice. It was uh, probably one of the most uh, brutal experiences that uh, my colleagues, my teammates, up until that point had been through. And it was just, it was all that mental, who's gonna fold, who's gonna just suck it up and shut their mouth and just keep running and doing what we ask, who's here to get better. And it was just little by little things like that that at the time, you really didn't realize what was going on, but if you were there to win and you were there to work, you were gonna do what they asked you to do, and ultimately that's who was still there in 83 when we won our first SEC championship.
it was a uh, it was a brutal experience. We started out with over a hundred athletes, and uh, we finished that uh, spring football session with uh, just over sixty football players. But those sixty football players were bound and determined. They knew what it took. Uh, Coach Dye had and his staff really had 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 broken the team down and then built it back up. Dye's first season at the helm proved every bit as difficult as expected. After winning the season opener, Auburn dropped three straight, though the Tigers recovered to win four out of their final seven and performed well in losses against national powers Georgia and Alabama. Though the final record was five and six, close observers could tell this was a much different football team than the season before. Auburn's 1982 recruiting class included several who'd go on to play for NFL teams. Dye hoped some would be able to step up and contribute immediately. Those, combined with a group of upperclassmen who'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the nation's best the year before, would give Auburn a chance to make some noise in the SEC. But from day one, it was apparent there was something special about Bo Jackson. I remember the first uh, day that he was here, they put him at fullback, and we ran the wishbone. And the first play that we ran with him at fullback, I took the snap and I put the ball out and I put the ball in his ribs. And so I turned around to Bud Casey, the running back coach, and I said, hey coach, you need to back him up a little bit. You know, I'd been here, this was my fourth year, so I'd been around and here's a freshman the first day, even though he was uh, highly recruited and we all knew he was gonna be a great player, he's still first day as a freshman. And uh, coach Casey said, I'll get him lined up right. So he did, and we ran the same play over and I put the ball out and stuck it in his ribs again. And I turned and looked at Coach Casey and he said, you better speed up. And he was right. Um, Bo was so quick in, in the hole that it was, he was so much faster than any other fullback we had that I just didn't adjust. In the weight room, everybody wanted to be on a Schwarzenegger. So, you know, you, once you bench press 400 pounds, you're in this category and your pitch is up on the wall. If you squat a thousand pounds, then you're, pitches up on the wall, but back in the early 80s, 82, 80, 80, 81, 2, 3, you know, you name it, 400 pounds was a milestone. It was like running a less than four minute mile, I guess. Um, but this guy comes in as a freshman and throws up 400, and we're going, wow, wow, this is, it's okay, something is Mm, right with this guy here. Over at the stadium, there's a fence, a chain link fence that goes right in front of the stadium, right in front of the bleachers. Um, it had to have been, you know, about almost chest high. And when I saw Bo stand flat footed and jump over that fence, Tim Jesse and I looked at each other and said, no, nah, we didn't just see what we just saw. Great, great teammate. I mean, hung around with everybody, never Never, and to this day, any time I've ever seen him, has never put on, you know, the show that he's Bo Jackson and, you know, he's higher celebrity status than anybody else that had ever been to Auburn or had played in the NFL. Or, and, and to me, that's a compliment. I mean that in the highest, because he has all the right because of who he is and what he's done and accomplished uh, that, you know, you see that go to some guy's heads. He was the most humble person. You know, I meant to just to meet him and to the, his level of maturity. Uh, it was just off the chain. It wasn't a scale. Uh, nobody else that I had ever met in my life with that physical ability. Now I'm looking up at the guy and looking out at the guy, and he's that fast. That was scary. The thing about it, big guys you thought you could evade or get away from, but no, he is a big stud about 6'2", and it's about 225, outrunning everybody. Wow. Tigers started the season on the right note, beating Wake Forest 28-10 at Jared and Hare after losing to them the year before. Sensational junior running back Lionel James delivered 118 yards and a touchdown on 10 carries. And Bo Jackson was spectacular in his college debut rushing for 123 yards and two touchdowns on 10 carries. We were able to 
really have a few days of rest before that game, which was much needed rest, uh, something that we hadn't had through uh, training camp coming up into the uh, game. Couldn't wait for those games to start because the games were easy. Practice was a killer. Saturdays was like Christmas. It was a relief to get on the football field. It was almost somewhat of a vacation. It was a chance for us to get out there and hit somebody else other than someone who had a blue jersey on. I'm just sitting on the sideline. I'm just and I'm nervous as a cat in a dog pound because I've never seen a crowd that big. Game we felt, you know, obviously we should win. And, you know, again, that, that was kind of that mentality at that point that now we're in a position that when we're supposed to beat somebody, and especially when we're playing at home, let's get it done. And we ran an option play to the wide side of the field, toward their sideline. We were in the option play, and Randy Campbell pitches the ball. Perfect. Pow. I catch the ball, and pow. And boom, down the sideline. 74 yards for a touchdown. And I, I don't remember that game being... 28-10, uh, even as close as, as the score says. Um, but, you know, first game, it was a night game, a lot of emotion, a lot of good stuff going on, and, and we took care of business. Auburn jumped to a 21-6 lead against Southern Mississippi in week two on scoring catches of 47 and 51 yards by Mike Edwards and a Jackson touchdown run. But Golden Eagles quarterback Reggie Collier brought his team fighting back in field goal range as the clock expired. The Tigers won a close one, 21 to 19, but lost a key player on defense, all SEC lineman Donnie Humphrey, who tore a ligament in his knee. After two successful warm-ups, a sellout crowd welcomed SEC opponent Tennessee to the Plains. James and Jackson led the way with 239 yards and three touchdowns rushing between them. But the Auburn defense was the story of the day forcing four turnovers and giving up only 94 yards on the ground. Linebacker Greg Carr led the way with 16 tackles and a 24-14 win. We had something on offense uh, with our offensive, uh, our newfound offensive power that uh, they could keep the ball and, and, and ball control, and, and that's something that we hadn't seen the year before. The second or third play of the game, we ran a play-action pass, and I threw a ball to Chris Woods down the middle on a post route. And for us to run that kind of play, the second or third play of a game, was probably unexpected. And I just remember our student section just going berserk. It was a lot of fun. That game, we were better conditioned. And, and I think we, we beat Tennessee that day because we, uh, we were in better shape. And I, I really think we wanted it more. And I think uh, we were a hungrier football team. Just worked hard on conditioning to outlast them. and. Um, Man, it was just one of your typical showdown SEC ball game. Uh, that day, I felt like we all felt like we were fairly well rested and were able to give 100%. That was, you know, first time in my career we had beaten them in a lot of guys' careers. And uh, again, it, it just instilled that little confidence that, hey, we beat a pretty good football team, and it was, you know, by, by a double digit margin. Having played eighth ranked Nebraska tough in 1981, Auburn was ready to make a national statement in week four. Up by only a touchdown at the half, the Cornhuskers relied on depth and blew Auburn out the rest of the way. Mike Rozier led Nebraska to 375 yards on the ground and a 41-7 road win. The difficult loss showed Dye and his team how far they still had to go to be among the nation's elite. Nebraska had so many great players. I mean, they had Mike Rozier, Roger Craig, Dean Steincooler, Dave Remington, and, and those are all on offense. I don't remember some of the defensive players' names, but they had such a great football team. And the year before, we had played in Lincoln, had lost 17 nothing, and fumbled two times inside their 10-yard line. So, as I've said before, again, that was getting close, but we, you know, turned the ball over, made mistakes. Uh, so I think when they came to Auburn, it was kind of like, all right, we played you tough in Lincoln. They came in, in in 82, and at halftime, it was 14 to seven or something like that. And, and we were ready to go and said, we've got a chance for this. And we played them close for a while. Um, I want to, I think it was uh, seven to seven right before the half. And they scored one touchdown right at the end of the half and went up 14 to seven. And then the second half, they just came out and flexed their muscle and they were just, they were by far the best football team 
I think that we played. I know when we played Georgia later in the year, Georgia was ranked number one, but I thought Nebraska was a better team. It kind of gave you a little dose of reality that maybe we're not quite as good as we think we are yet. A fired up Tiger defense pounced on Kentucky the following week, allowing only seven first downs in an 18 to three win. Linebacker Ronnie Ballou paced the defense with 10 tackles and Bo added 111 yards on 18 carries for the offense. But it was a career day for Al Del Greco, who scored all of Auburn's points on six field goals. He set an SEC mark and tied an NCAA mark with his performance. But most importantly, he saved his job. And I can remember Coach Dyke pulling me in his office and saying, hey, you know, what's going on? And uh, why I was struggling, I don't actually remember. It's just one of those things. Uh, but, you know, he was upfront enough with me to say I might have to make a change. He said, I'm going to, you know, give you another chance. We'll, we'll see what happens. And then, lo and behold, that was the Kentucky game. It was a defensive game for us as far as uh, shutting down Kentucky. Uh, we uh, felt like we had a good game plan. They uh, didn't have many yards uh, passing or rushing against us. Well, I tell you, we moved the football and got in the red zone. We just couldn't punch it in. And uh, they just physically matched up against the wishbone. Well, Coach Dye was going nuts over that. I mean, when you run the wishbone, you don't get in the end zone, especially by the fourth quarter. So uh, that, that wasn't so good for our offensive team. <laughs> so we didn't score a touchdown. But our offense never quite got in gear. They could drive the ball, but we just couldn't. We just couldn't. Uh, just couldn't close the deal. And uh, fortunately, we had Aldo Greco on our team. Six opportunities to kick field goals in a game just doesn't come along around a lot. And uh, little by little, I made each one, and with each one came a little bit more confidence. And uh, I think, you know, honestly, I I'm not sure how many people were happier for me than Coach Die was. To be honest with you. Really proud of Al, and I, I know, I, I'm assuming that that was a record at the time and may still be a record for most field goals in a single game by an Auburn kicker. At that time, it was an SEC record for field goals in a game. Um, actually broke the record of the guy, uh, George Portella, that taught me how to kick, that kicked at Auburn before me. Greg Carr, Quincy Williams, and Dow Altman each posted more than 10 tackles in a week six beatdown of Georgia Tech. Bob Harris added two interceptions as the defense allowed only 153 yards and posted a shutout. Lionel James had more than 200 all-purpose yards and a 24-0 win over the Yellow Jackets. The Tigers finally hit the road in week seven, traveling to Starkville to battle Mississippi State. Bo was back in the lineup, contributing a touchdown after sitting out the previous week. But it was the Lionel James show on offense, Little Train, scoring one of three fourth quarter touchdowns to bring the Tigers from behind for the win, 35 to 17. Now six and one, three and zero in the SEC, Auburn moved back into the top 20 at number 19, but it wouldn't last. Auburn led by a point late in the game against Florida but a questionable call on an onside kick gave Florida the opportunity for a 42-yard game-winning field goal, and the Tigers suddenly found themselves on the losing end of things, 1917. We were undefeated in the SEC, playing against a good Florida football team. Florida's a hard place to play. Gainesville, I always thought, was one of the toughest opposing stadiums that I ever played in. It was humid hot on the field, it was a uh, artificial uh, surface. It was a, um, it was a battle from the uh, get-go. We had an 80-yard touchdown call back for a penalty in the game. I threw a post route to Chris Woods and he caught it and just outran everybody on Florida's team. And they said I was in the end zone when he threw the flag. A couple other calls, uh, my recollection is that, you know, didn't necessarily go our way. They kicked off to us with just a few moments to go in the game and the onside kick. Uh, kicked directly at Lionel James. And Lionel James comes out of the pile with the football and they give the ball to Florida. You know, we all thought Lionel had the ball and he told us when he came to the sideline, you know, he said, Coach, I had the ball. And when I was at the bottom of the pile, they took it away from him. 
Now, I don't know if we'd have won the game on a field goal or not uh, and come back to win. You had two solid football teams going at it, and unfortunately, we came out on the short end that day. Randy Campbell tossed two touchdown passes the following week against Rutgers. Chris Woods and Mike Edwards each hauling in three catches and a score. Bo added 114 yards and a touchdown to go with Tim Drinkard's 13 tackles and a lopsided 30-7 win. But Rutgers was merely the undercard for the following week's main event. Toft ranked Georgia an eventual Heisman when a Herschel Walker visited Jordan Hare, and it was a fight to the finish. The Bulldogs led 13-7 in the fourth until Lionel James reeled off an unforgettable 87-yard run, giving Auburn a late 14-13 advantage. With their number one ranking on the line, Georgia drove 80 yards to retake the lead. But the Tigers weren't finished, taking the ball all the way to the Bulldogs' 14 before coming up short. Georgia pulls off the heartbreak. 1914. We were playing against the number one team in the country. Georgia was the number one team. If we were ever going to prove ourselves in any one game, it was going to be against Georgia. You know, because Coach Dye played there, we knew it meant a lot to him. It meant a lot to us as well. But that just amped the whole thing up as well as going into that game each time we played. We played Georgia because that's his alma mater. It was just a knockdown drag out between the, um, you know, in the trenches. And of course, they had the, the infamous Herschel Walker, and we had Bo Jackson. That was wow, that was a big game. Uh, those two guys on the field playing against each other. Georgia played like a champion. They, uh, they answered our every call. We would get the ball and drive down and score, and Georgia would answer that score, and they would drive down on us. And they were an incredibly talented football team, obviously spearheaded by, by Herschel Walker, who, uh, who was an incredible athlete. And uh, we're winning the game in the fourth quarter, 14 to 12, and, and Herschel breaks a long run. I think it was 50-something yards. And they go ahead 19-14. They kick off with about six minutes to go. And we drove it all the way to their nine-yard line, and we couldn't score. You know, part of that, I think, you give credit to Georgia uh, because they were a darn good football team. Um, but again, you know, it was one of those things that we were almost there. And that was a heart-wrenching, tough game to lose. And I really didn't have a tough plan for getting beat. I don't think there's any question that you, you fought a good fight against a real fine football team. I hope that we can learn from today. I hope it'll make us come back and work harder, make us hungrier, give us more determination than ever to win. He only, I mean, he really thought we were going to win the game. And he never thought about what am I going to say if we get beat. And that showed me that he had a lot of uh, confidence and a lot of hope and optimism in our football team in the direction it was going. You know, the locker room after each game was always profound. Um, in wins or losses, Coach Dye never missed an opportunity to teach a life lesson. And Coach Dye said it was so quiet, and all he could hear was, it's great to be an Auburn Tiger. Say, it's great to be an Auburn Tiger. You could hear our fans in the stadium chanting, it's great to be an Auburn Tiger. We could hear that. They never know, I don't know how many stayed, but the majority of our fans didn't leave the stadium. And they had just seen our team grow up. Contrast the quietness and the disappointment of the dressing room to the attitude of the Auburn people outside and on top of the dressing room. It's great to be an Auburn Tiger. They said this in defeat. In defeat, it's great to be an Auburn Tiger. Following the Georgia game, the 7-3 Plainsmen were given two weeks to recover and prepare for Alabama. After coming close in 1981, Dye was sure this would be the year Auburn would finally end Bear Bryant's streak of dominance in the series, now stretched to nine years. 
Rumors were abounding that the 1982 game would be the Bears' final Iron Bowl appearance, and given one more shot at his mentor, Dye wanted to send him out with a loss. But little did anyone know that Bo Jackson, now on the cusp of football stardom with 715 rushing yards and eight touchdowns in his freshman season, had grown weary of the demands of his new life. Friday night, a little more than a week before the biggest game of his young career, Bo packed his bags and left Sewell Hall with no plans to return. A week before the Bama game, I'm thinking about going home because of this football thing is lasting too long. And well, you know, the, the pressure, you know, has a way of, 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 of getting to you. You know, when you have the Auburn Nation up on your shoulders, I'm going to say the Auburn Nation. Yes, I did say the Auburn Nation up on your shoulders. And uh, sometimes those burdens get kind of heavy. Coach Wallace that recruited me, uh, I called him and told him that I was at the bus station and I was thinking about going home. He felt like going to back home, he wouldn't have to deal with all the pressures of being uh, Bo Jackson. He can go back to being Vince. Call uh, Coach Wallace, he said, go back to the dorm. And I'll be over. So we sat in the parking lot and talked. He said, do you realize what you bring to this university? Not only to the university, but to the Auburn fans. Now, and also, do you realize that if you were to show up at home right now, do you realize that we would be going to your funeral next week? Because your mom's going to kill you. <laughs> your mom is going to kill you. Beat the crap out of him and put him back in the car and brought him back down here. That's what Miss Bunn would have done. I'm going to tell you right now. I know. I don't have to even second guess myself. I know what she would have done. You wouldn't want to disappoint her. And if you could disappoint anybody on the planet, but you don't want to disappoint your mom. He knew exactly what to say uh, at that moment, uh, which eased Bo's worries, uh, which caused him to put a look, just a little bit more trust in Coach Dye. With Bo safely back in the fold, Dye and Jack Crow, his offensive coordinator, added a new wrinkle to the offense, the I formation. Heading into a gray afternoon at Pax Legion Field in front of a national television audience, Dye and his team believed they were ready to take Alabama's best shot. It was the same feeling that I had when I stepped out on the field at Auburn for the first time against Wake Forest, but it was intensified about 10 times. Coach, I told us, he said, guys, he said, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna be in a fight of your life from the first whistle blow until the last second tick off that clock. You're gonna be in for the fight of your life. I can truly say that every player in that locker room knew how bad he wanted to beat his, his old coach. You haven't played in a game like this before. You haven't played in a game, and you probably won't play in a game like this again until this time next year. I know everybody felt it. And you could see that look on his face, and, and, and I can honestly say that every player wanted to get that victory for him. We had, uh, I think the guys today call it swagger. We had, we had some, un we had unbelievable confidence going into it. Even though we had lost to Georgia, at the end of the Georgia game, and they're about to go play in Sugar Bowl and just won the national championship year before, we knew we could play. And just go out and do what you do. Even if it's of Alabama, I mean, we didn't have all that weight. Like, this is the biggest game of the history of Auburn. You know, y'all lost 10, and you're expected to win this one. We just went out there and played, man. Played together, trusted each other, and trusted the coach's scheme. So going into the Auburn-Alabama game with all the momentum and what had happened after the Georgia game with the fans, we knew that we were fixing to give them a pretty good dose. Crimson Tide will kick off. Terry Sanders, the sophomore from Birmingham, will hit the ball. Lionel James, the junior from Auburn, waits for it deep in the end zone. There will be no return. After both teams' opening drive stalled, the offenses settled into the flow of the game. Auburn pushed all the way to midfield but failed to convert on fourth and inches. Alabama got the ball back and took the lead on a Walter Lewis touchdown pass to Joey Jones. 
Alabama pretty much moved the ball at will during the game. They, uh, they had a tremendous game plan. Uh, we felt like we were fighting hard. We felt like we were playing hard. I think we were prepared going into that football game. Uh, but I think Alabama, for the first three quarters, uh, uh, was the better football team. We threw something at them that they weren't expecting. We lined up in the I formation early in the game and put Bo at fullback. And I had adjusted to his speed over the two years so I could get the ball to him. But uh, we didn't have a lot of plays out of the eye because we just put it in during that two weeks as a changeup. So we had Lionel at tailback and Bo at fullback. But I remember when we would give it to Bo, I mean, he was so fast into the line that he would gain four, five, six yards. It seemed like to me almost every time. The Tiger offense failed to move the ball and returned it to the Crimson Tide who steamrolled all the way to Auburn's 30. Free safety Mark Dorman knocked the ball away from Joe Carter and into the hands of Tim Drinkard who returned it 62 yards before Lewis caught him at the 14. Three plays later, James took it past Jeremiah Castillo for the score. Del Greco tied things up at seven. Alabama took back the lead with a field goal. Then late in the half, a hit on Lewis led to a Bob Harris interception. Auburn made the most of it, Randy Campbell going in for the score, giving the Tigers a 14-10 lead. The Tide managed one final field goal before intermission, but Auburn, with less than 100 yards rushing in the first half, held on to a 14-13 advantage. Alabama opened the second half taking command. Lewis masterfully engineered his offense down the field. Paul Ott Carew scored on a 10-yard run, but couldn't hang on to the ball in a two-point conversion attempt. The missed opportunity would pay big dividends for Auburn a short time later, but the Tide held the lead 19-14. Auburn's offense started the half in the I formation, but failed to convert. Alabama got the ball back and drove all the way to the five before settling for a field goal. Bryant's boys looked to be well in control. The score now 22-14 with Auburn managing only 132 yards of offense through three quarters. Following an Alabama punt, the Auburn offense showed some signs of life. A big bow run moved the ball all the way to the tied 13, and a few plays later, Del Greco closed the gap to five points, 22-17. The big play he had in the game wasn't necessarily the touchdown. It was a 53-yard run he made to set up the field goal that put us within five points. That changed the whole dynamics of the football game because it was late in the fourth quarter and, and uh, once we closed it to within five, then Alabama went to try to get the game over with. We hadn't stopped them all day but they ran the football three straight times and we stopped them. I think we began to uh, play tougher football and we were able to, uh, you know, to shut down uh, Alabama's uh, uh, threats to us. And, uh, and we really put our offense in a position to drive the ball. A few plays later, faced with third and 14, Campbell hit Mike Edwards on the sideline to move the ball to Alabama's 31. Two plays later, Castile stepped in front of another Campbell pass and intercepted. But a pass interference call gave Auburn a first down at the Crimson Tide 9. A penalty on first down and a short gain on second put Auburn back at the 9, facing third and goal. A Campbell pass to Jackson sent Bo barreling towards the end zone, face to face with two Alabama All-Americans, Castile and Tommy Wilcox. Jackson leaped and landed. The ball marked at the one foot line. Fourth and goal, two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. It all boiled down to this, student versus master. A nine year Alabama win streak. Two years of gut wrenching work in the boiler room, on the practice field, on the recruiting trail. A chance for Auburn to announce its return to college football's elite as the nation watched. The play, officially called number 43, would forever be known as Bo Over the Top. Nobody split. Give the ball up and over, and in, I believe. Touchdown. Touchdown, Auburn. And Auburn leads 21-17.
22. Well, fourth and one, everybody knew what the play was. Alabama knew what the play was going to be. The fans knew what the play was going to be. We went on a double tight offense, and that further confirmed what the play was going to be because, you know, I came, the receiver came out of the game, and, and Jeff Parks and Ed West was in a double tight to give a better blockers, you know, so everybody knew what was going to happen. I mean, you got you got to give it to your best back in a, in, a, in that situation. And if you get beat, you get beat. But you're gonna get you're gonna make them beat the best you got. Well, I didn't like it. You know, Coach Dye did, of course. Uh, he would have called it. Um, I was hoping we were gonna hit Bo outside on the corner, but um, you know, that's the old center for you. But. Uh, you know, I just knew, I, I, Bishop, you just don't let your man penetrate. If I can get the snap and give it to him, he'll score. And, I mean, that may sound ridiculous in that this is the 11th game of the season, and, and we don't fumble snaps. We had not fumbled a snap the whole year. The snap was going to be firm. It was going to hit Randy's hands. We weren't going to have a fumble. You know, that was my first and foremost. I mean, down there at that point in time after – the whole ball game, I mean, I just said, this ain't going to be on my shoulders. I worried I, when I was going up there. I said, I've got to make sure, because I'm going straight backwards to hand the ball off, and they're going the other way. And it only takes about this much of separation, and the ball's going to be on the ground. And so <clears throat> I just had to make sure that I stayed under the center and rode the center until I got that ball before I could leave. I'd have killed him if he had dropped it. So it would have killed me if I would you know, snapped it under his hands. I mean, I've always felt like, and I felt like then, if I got the ball to bow, he would score. I didn't think they could stop him. Anyway, we got a good snap and got the play off, and the rest is history. Him handing, Randy handing that ball off to Bo, and You know, we've seen Bo go over the top. Just an amazing athlete. He could jump over trains. You know, he used to wear that little ass for Superman. But I took about one and a half steps and and just got airborne. Took one and a half steps, got airborne. And it was like, bang, bang, it was quick. It was quick. And I remember him getting onto me, and as I'm turning in the air, he submarine got onto me, and I kind of pushed off of him and turned on my back and laid over and extended across the goal line this way. It was a lot closer than I expected it would be, and both second effort really is the reason that we scored the touchdown. I'm looking at the ref down the side, and they're running toward the foul. Then all of a sudden, he, I saw his hand go, and he went like that. I'm like, thank God. Um, on his initial dive and coming down, I don't think he was over. And then he kind of turned his body and, and got in. And I was just fortunate enough to where I could get my hand on top of his helmet and stretch over to get him underneath me. And if you look at that tape, he may not have made it on the first dive. But with his heart, his desire, and his intensity, and his dogged down determinedness, he wiggles, <laughs> and he gets over. Nobody's split. Give the ball up and over, and in, I believe. Touchdown. Touchdown, Auburn. And Auburn leads 23 to 22. Trailing 23 to 22, Alabama got the ball back. Two passes fell incomplete and a run produced only four yards. On fourth down, Lewis was intercepted by Bob Harris, his second of the day, and it appeared the game was over. You know, after that, you're going, good night, you know, and the exuberance and the excitement, and you look up on the scoreboard and you go, there's still two minutes left. Now, they still had time. I mean, and all they needed was a field goal, so our defense had to win the game. You know, everybody, we all know Bo won the game by going by Bo over the top and scoring a touchdown, but our defense had to win the game. You go, my gosh, come on defense. And we're all, on, some of us anywhere on the sideline, well, probably all of us praying, going, Lord, you know, just give the defense the strength and the defensive uh, coordinators the wisdom. And, uh, you know, Bob Harris, a senior strong safety, intercepted a pass uh, somewhere around midfield. And, um, and I think there were there were a few more plays after that, but uh, but that was what sealed the deal. The Auburn offense took over and produced nine yards on two plays. 
On third down, Dye sent Bo over the top once more, but the unthinkable happened. A fumble gave the Tide one last shot. With 109 remaining, Lewis hit Jesse Bendross for completions of 15 and 11 yards. Three more downs produced only four yards, and a fourth down pass fell incomplete. This time, it was over. Auburn 23, Alabama 22. And uh, the last seconds ticked off, off of the clock. I made it a point to look across the field and directly across the field on the 50-yard line was Ken Donahue, the coach that told me that we would never beat at Alabama. He was standing beside Coach Bryant, locked arm in arm with Coach Bryant, and they walked toward the field. And I just looked at him and just, and went off the field because things were getting a little crazy. What a perfect way to, uh, to cap off the 82 season and begin a run of SEC championships in the 80s, Heisman Trophy winner and all those things, and to, and to hand it to him. And I just remember sitting there and, and just the pure joy of, of it all being over. Hey, we finally beat them. And everybody said, let's get to the locker room. So we're tired. And we went in, we got on one knee, we took a knee, and we prayed, and Coach and I gave a speech, and, and we could listen that all of the fans were still in the stadium. Coach I said, I don't know about you all. He said, but I'm gonna go back out here and celebrate with our fans because they deserve it, and we did. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you, the ones that want to, I'm gonna go back out there and thank our people. You know, in, in 1982, teams didn't do that. They just didn't. You know, now, for the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of times they, just, they don't ever even leave the field. You know, everybody grabs the flag and runs around. We used to, when the game was over, we went in the locker room and we never came back out. Um, people didn't used to tear goalposts down very much. And so when we came back out on the field and I saw the goalpost was about halfway down and all our fans were on the field, it was the most incredible sight I'd ever seen. Team came back, all the Auburn people were on the field and tore the goalpost down and were ripping up the turf. Nine years is a long time to lose to your rival. And oh, it was a wonderful a family day. Oh, it was wonderful. The only thing that I wanted to do was find my mom. And I'm looking up, and I'm like, and I ask, have anybody seen, because everybody knew my mom, because she had on a jersey, Bo's mom. <laughs> I'm mother of 34. And everybody was pointing, she's over there, she's over there. And I'm looking, so I'm looking, and everybody's giving me high fives and, 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 and so forth. And I finally find her, and they are trying to carve her way down to her. And I get to my mom, and I hug her and I start crying. And, and everybody who's ever been in a situation to where the person that you want to hug is a person that you know that have been in your corner all your life. And I hugged her and I'm listening to fans thank her. Now my mom cleaned hotel rooms and homes all her life. But yet all these people that wouldn't have gotten a chance to know her if I didn't come at all. All these people are thanking my mom and hugging my mom for allowing me to come to Auburn. All right, tearing down the goalpost in this monumental victory, ladies and gentlemen, as the Auburn Tigers have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 23 to 22. I think it restored pride in the Auburn people. Um, you know, now people were proud to wear their Auburn jacket or hang their Auburn flag, and you know, particularly right here in the state because of the intensity of the rival. Rival living next door to a, you know opposing fan is hard to hang that flag up if you've lost a few times in a row. It all began to change when Bo went over the top. And you look at the number of games Auburn has won 
against Alabama since that day. And the number we had won against Alabama prior to that day, the number is strikingly different. I mean, it was a great privilege and an honor, I think, for all of us uh, on that football team to, to be able to play with him and have him as a part of our team. I know that we couldn't have done what we did um, in 82, and we couldn't have done what we did in 83 and win a conference championship and go 11-1 and one if we didn't have Bo on the team. I've played with uh, a lot of great players, and playing with Bo Jackson has been uh, one of the greatest moments of my life. Bo Jackson, on that one play, changed the history of Auburn football. In the decades that have passed since the 1982 Iron Bowl, Auburn football has been a consistent performer on the national stage. Dozens of Tigers have populated NFL rosters, and Bo Jackson, the quiet kid from Bessemer, became a global phenomenon. And those who were part of it, who paid the price in blood, sweat, and tears so that Auburn football could be great again, say those are the kinds of sacrifices you make for the good of the family. There's not a day of my life that goes by that I don't, uh, that I don't draw on those experiences that, that, I, that I had while I was at Auburn. If I could go back, I would. And I wouldn't change anything. I think I came in here a boy, and I left a man. And all these things, all this adversity that we faced in these different manners brought us all closer together. And being a part of it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's priceless. It's something you have for the rest of your life. Auburn football is not about going out scoring a touchdown or, or winning a game. For me, it's about family. It's about growing as a family. Dude. 